but I feel better at 45 than I did at 25. I don't know anyone else who says that, <laughs> but I really do at 25. I was getting blood clots. I had, I had kidney issues. I had lupus and 45. I have beautiful labs. You know, my cholesterol is like 156. You know, I have amazing health. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast, Dr. Goldner. Great to sit down with you again. It's my pleasure to be back. It's good to see you. You have some exciting research and a, and a really important study that you wanted to talk about and explain to us why this really matters. So I'd love to hear from you about the study and, and what, have your, what is your um, assertions of this? Oh, I'm super fired up about this. So out in your neighborhood uh, at uh, Francis Crick Institute, it's a biomedical institute out in London, genetic researchers were trying to figure out why autoimmune diseases have been on the rise over the past 40 years and significantly on the rise. We're talking about increases in from three to 9% per year in autoimmune diseases and spreading to areas of the world where they didn't exist before or rarely were ever seen, like Asia and the Middle East suddenly having autoimmune inflammatory bowel disease, which didn't happen there before. So they're trying to figure out, has genetics been changing? Are we evolving somehow genetically to have more autoimmune diseases since these are considered genetic diseases? And what they found is no, human genetics has not significantly changed over the past 40 years. We haven't seen anyone with gills, no new antennas forming. Genetically, we're about static as we were 40 years ago. So the only conclusion they could draw was that the rise and spread of autoimmune diseases exactly mimics the rise and spread of the Western diet. So as more and more people around the world are eating high amounts of meat and dairy, fast foods, all the different Western foods, they're also having rising rates of all the different autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, type two or type one diabetes, sorry, um, scleroderma, lupus, all of these different autoimmune diseases are increasing at the very same rate. Now, unfortunately, what they said, what the researchers concluded was we can't stop people from eating this way. We can't stop the spread of the Western diet. So instead, they're going to work on more medicines. Maybe we can target your genes. Maybe we can affect gene expression better. Uh, but that was their conclusion was that nothing to do about diet. We'll just work on more medications. But I got really fired up. I said, no, the, the cause and the cure, those are the same, right? That we can change the way we eat and we can reverse these diseases and we can stop the spread. I mean, that's what I do every day. I help people reverse and eliminate their autoimmune diseases by switching to a hypernourishing plant-based diet. So there's so much we can do. And that part always frustrates me. Every time I see a study where they show that eating meat or dairy, Western foods, causes disease, the researcher or the doctor who performed the research will say, well, you know, you can't tell people what to eat. We'll just find new medicines. Uh, but I insist that there's a better way. I mean, I myself have been lupus free for 16 years now since changing my diet. And I want to make sure everybody else knows they can do the same. So really what we're seeing is that everything we've already known, at least you and me know, is being confirmed over and over again by more research that comes out. Mm. It's such powerful research, and it really is a sort of damning indictment, as they say, to the sad diet, the standard American diet. You know, what are some of the ways that you as a doctor can actually help people make these changes? Because people are afraid to shift away from things that they're familiar with. You know, these kinds of diets that people have grown up on for generations are so familiar. They're very heavily full of saturated fats, salts, oils, etc., and people are, you could say, are very addicted to these types of foods. What are some of the tricks and tips which you use to help your patients make the shift away from these types of foods? Well, I think, first of all, what you just did, I validate the fact that food is complicated, right? That it's not just, oh, this is bad for you, eat this. Oh, thanks, man. If, if everybody did that, nobody would be watching TV eating a bag of chips. Everybody knows it's not healthy, right? So it's not just an information problem. Food is about customs. It's about traditions. It's about addiction. So we just need to acknowledge that this is going to be complicated. I, I remember I was once doing a keynote talk for a doctor out in the West here in the U.S., I wouldn't identify him, but he was a surgeon that had come to realize that every time he cut somebody open, if they happened to be vegan, it was an area where there are a lot of vegans, that he didn't see all the inflammation in their joints. Their joints looked really beautiful, like a textbook. And then when he did surgery on 
other folks eating the sad diet, and it truly is sad, uh, he would see all this inflammation in their joints. So he came to it that way and went, what, what's going on with these joints and why do they look so different? So he had me come and give a talk. He had started a new plant-based movement in his, in his town, which was wonderful. And what he told me uh, on the side was, you know, I tell my patients to switch to a plant-based diet. And if they don't, I fire them for being non-compliant. And I just started laughing. I said, you're such a surgeon. You know, it doesn't work that way. You can't just say, do this. And then everything changes. You have to understand the emotional component of eating, the addictive component of eating, and be compassionate with people. So I acknowledge all of that. And I also talk to them about what I call the stories they tell themselves. Every time I ask someone, tell me what you eat. It should take five minutes. I have this for breakfast. I have this for lunch. I have this for dinner. This is what I snack on. There's always a story. Well, I was really hungry and had a hard day, so I did have some of this. And I'm like, stop the stories. I don't want the stories. I want to just hear what you're doing. Let's actually focus on what you did. What's your trigger? What were you feeling when you made that decision? Because it was a decision. Whenever someone says, I accidentally ate some cake, I said, what do you mean? Did you trip and fall and your face landed in the cake? I mean, come on, let's talk about what you did and why. And when they can start talking in a real way about the emotional side of eating, well, I was feeling really you know, stressed out from work and, and my, my brain craved cake to feel better. Okay, what else could help you feel better? Maybe calling a friend, maybe you can go do some exercise and get those endorphins another way. My grandmother was pressuring me to eat her favorite soup that she made. My, you know, then, okay, how about talking to your grandmother about how much you love her and, and, and maybe you could do something else that's traditional besides eating the food. But we need to address these things because it is difficult. And for the people I see, Many times they are so sick that all they really enjoy anymore is food. They don't go out. They're not working. You know, they're, they're on the couch. They're in pain. And so sometimes the only thing they're looking forward to is when Uber Eats shows up with their burger. And so we need to really learn how to find pleasure in new ways. I really think that the, the uh, I put in quotes, the foods we've created, the, the, the food-like drugs we've created have really taken the place of people actually going out and pursuing things that make them happy. Exercise will give you wonderful endorphins, but you do have to get up and move. That takes effort. Having food delivered and sitting there and eating, it takes no effort, right? Calling a friend, doing something active, all the things that create the positive endorphins that we want, they take a lot more effort than sitting down and jamming something into your mouth. And so we've really gotten addicted to these things in a big way. And many people I talk to don't even know how to create pleasure in their life in any other way. So it is extremely complicated. And I really try to support people in all of those aspects because honestly, the food part's the easiest thing. Once they're emotionally ready and once they've decided to do it, eat this, don't eat that, it's actually pretty easy. It's, it's the decision that's difficult. So we are still living amongst, uh, amidst uh, a global pandemic that is still raging across the planet. You know, there's some 80,000 plus new cases every day in the UK, over 200 people dying a day in the UK. And last week it was over 500 people a day still dying, yet we're carrying on as normal, but that's a different, that's a subject for a different time. However, one of the important things is that not enough people are talking about the effects of diet on our bodies in conjunction with the onset of COVID-19. What happens to our body when we're eating a healthy, well, particularly our immune system? What happens to our immune system when we're eating a healthy plant-based diet when COVID-19 enters our body? So we talked about this a bit last time, and there's a lot of really compelling research that's been done, which is wonderful. It's rare to see research where they're looking at in real time at people getting sick and what they're eating. And there was a study done right at the beginning of the pandemic, before we had vaccines, before we had any treatments, there, where they were looking at the frontline workers, to doctors, nurses, uh, to see... Uh, how many of them were getting moderate to severe COVID? And by the way, what do they eat? Which I thought was really fascinating. And what they found at the time was that anyone who identified as plant-based in any way, vegan, plant-based, not even looking at, are you eating salads or impossible burgers, which is vegan, plant-based, that those folks had uh, over 70% reduced rate of moderate to severe COVID compared to the other doctors and nurses, which is extraordinary. That's not a small amount. That's a significant amount. Then when they looked at pescatarian, people who identified as pescatarian, meaning they eat a lot of plants and fish, it went down significantly. They had increased protection over everyone else, uh, but not as much as a plant-based eater. It dropped almost 30%. So, okay, so you add a little bit of fish, boom, your immune system functions uh, better than most, but not as good as people who don't eat fish, which I thought was very important distinction. And then uh, they looked at people who identified as you know high protein, low carb, keto, uh, paleo, 
So they looked at those folks. And what was really astonishing is those folks had almost a 50% higher rate of moderate to severe COVID. So you're looking at the dif difference between 70% protected versus 50% more at risk. That is extraordinary and very, very big divide. And, and the researchers at the time, they couldn't, they didn't know why this was happening. They thought maybe it's because people who eat plants get more nutrients and that would help the immune system function properly. And people who eat mostly protein, which protein isn't a food, people who eat mostly meat uh, are not getting many nutrients and their immune system isn't going to function as well. Yes, very much the case. So when you're looking at chronic disease, and I have a very unique way of looking at chronic disease, in my opinion, chronic disease is man-made. That the natural state of the cells, the cells of our body, and we're made of cells, about 100 trillion of them, the natural state of cells is that if they become injured, they then repair themselves. Right. As an organism, the way we're designed is if something happens to us, we get an injury, whether it's a trauma, emotional trauma, or whether it's a virus, we get an injury. We either die from the injury or we survive and go back to normal. That's the natural state, one of the two. But we've created this intermediary state where we get sick, but we, can't, we can survive, but we can't fully repair it and we just stay broken. But it doesn't mean we can't get better. It's just that physiologically, we don't have the tools to get better. So if you're not getting better, it's actually one of two things. Either you're continuing to injure yourself or you don't have the tools to get better. So, you know, I always like to give this example of my buddy that he sprained his ankle once and I saw him on crutches and I said, hey, what, you know, what happened? I sprained my ankle. Two months later, I saw him and he was on crutches. I said, what the hell are you doing on crutches? And he said, I keep walking on the ankle. Right. So for some folks, they're chronically ill because they keep walking on the ankle. They're still doing things that make them sicker. So like the study we talked about in the beginning of the segment, maybe they are eating the Western diet and it's creating continuous injury to the body. And so they can't finish healing because they keep walking on the ankle. They keep injuring themselves or maybe they're anxious or depressed or traumatized. Maybe they're in an abusive relationship. There's many things that can affect uh, our health. Right. But the other part of it that's very important that this COVID study looked at is what about nutrients, right? So you need vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, all these different phytonutrients, omega-3 fatty acids, water. You need all of these things in order to repair damage and return cell function to normal. So if you are malnourished, which most people are, uh, that I mean, everyone that I see, but most people eating the Western diet are very malnourished, even if they're overweight. So we have both things going on in most people that they're continuously being injured by their lifestyle, by their diet, and they lack the nutrients to actually recover. And I know this is true because I've spent over a decade working with people, thousands of people now who have chronic illness and I get them to sleep, do self-care and hypernourish a plant-based diet where they're eating super high nutrient foods. And within days to weeks to maybe a couple months, decades of illness just goes away. So obviously their body could be healthy. It just didn't have the ability to finish doing the job it wanted to do. So I look at chronic COVID and COVID infections in the same way that the people, and I just got a message this week that annoyed me saying, hey, just so you know, we've officially made it a new diagnosis. Chronic COVID, post-COVID is a new diagnosis. And I went, no, it shouldn't be chronic, right? Everyone I've seen that has had chronic COVID all of their symptoms went away within a few weeks of hypernourishment. So chronic COVID is the same thing. We had enough nutrients left to survive, but not enough to finish the healing process. But if you supply the body with that, it can heal. So this whole idea of chronicity, it's really something that we've created through our own lifestyles and our lack of nutritional eating. It's so interesting. Uh, and I think you know, you've, you've outlined some thoughts there regarding hypernourishment. Just for those who don't know, who may have seen all your other videos, you talk about hypernourishment hyper quite a lot. Um, obviously, we talked about long haul COVID uh, in the last episode, but I'd love to learn a bit more about what your experience been in the last few months. You know, now the pandemic is somewhat plateaued in some areas, other areas not. But what is the continued narrative from your side of things about how a hypernourished diet can reverse the effects of COVID, like you say. So take it away from being a chronic condition. Absolutely. And it also can prevent it. I, I actually yesterday did a call with somebody who uh, she's someone that I worked with last year who had lupus and she texted me. I always give my cell phone number out. She texted me and said, you know, you saved my life a year ago. I'm still lupus free, but my boyfriend uh, now has autoimmune disease and cancer and COVID and he eats 
he eats fast food, junk food, meat, dairy, and she couldn't convince him to change it. Um, and she wanted to know if I would see him, which I, I did, but he didn't show up. So I ended up talking to her and, you know, that was the very first sign, you know, someone has to want it for themselves. But what's fascinating is that she was someone that was dying herself, changed to a hypernourishing plant-based diet. And I'll tell you more details about that in a second, but she changed her diet and the lupus went away. So here's someone who had, who should have been high risk because she'd had autoimmune disease. And she also had COVID because they, uh, they went to a wedding and everyone at the wedding was vaccinated and everyone was tested and a third of them came home with COVID. That's just the situation we're in right now with Omicron. And she's fine. She tested positive and her voice sounds a little weird, but she has no symptoms otherwise. She feels great, great energy, no problem. And her boyfriend is in bed and he can't even swallow. He can barely move. And she said every time she hands him a green smoothie, his temperature goes down and he swallows better. And then he'll demand some chicken soup and his temperature goes up and he gets worse again. So when you nourish yourself properly, the virus becomes easier to fight, just like that study where they were looking at the frontline workers. Now, uh, with chronic long haul, I'm seeing the same thing where a lot of the people who got COVID that didn't recover didn't even know they were going to be sick. A lot of these people thought they were healthy. And health is really a, a continuum. Health is not a static state where it's like a light switch. You're healthy, you're unhealthy. I mentioned that we had a, about 100 trillion cells. Because we have so many cells, we can have a good percentage of our cells be sick and not even feel it. We can walk around and have hundreds, thousands, even millions of cells be sick, be injured, and we don't even really notice, maybe a little bit more tired than we used to be. We just call it, oh, I'm just getting older or whatever it is, but it's damage that collects over time. So I think the people who developed the long COVID or post-COVID syndrome I think those were people who were already getting sick. They were already using up their supply of nutrients that they had. And this was just one last infection they couldn't get past because coronavirus, I mean, this virus is a very aggressive virus and your immune system needs to be strong to recover. So I think those people were about to be sick anyway. Maybe in the next few years, they would have developed autoimmune disease, high blood pressure, heart disease. They were on their way. They just didn't know it because they felt okay. And then the virus hit and they just couldn't recover and they got stuck. So uh, what I've seen, I have uh, something called a rapid recovery program where people have to listen to me like this every day and I keep them going and I keep them from their stories and I keep them focused and we deal with what comes up until they're able to just do it. Everyone who's done that program who has had long COVID got better, usually within three weeks. And it was really interesting in my last group, there was a gentleman who had lung scarring from COVID and he was on oxygen. So this wasn't long COVID. This was, he was on a respirator and he barely survived and he had scar tissue in his lungs. And so he couldn't breathe without oxygen. Uh, he did not go back to normal, but I can tell you that at the end of six weeks, he no longer needed oxygen and he could exercise again. So he still has a decrease in his lung function. He still has damage, but his lungs were able to heal enough that he was able to get off of that oxygen. And in the group right before him, this wasn't from COVID. We had somebody who, who was on the lung transplant list for interstitial lung disease, an autoimmune lung disease. And he was supposed to get a double lung transplant. And at the end of six weeks, they kicked him off the transplant list because his lungs were better enough that he didn't need it. And that wasn't from COVID, but something else. So another issue in the medical world is we always underestimate people's ability to heal their organs. I was able to publish reversing uh, end-stage kidney failure with nutrition. And, you know, I remember getting calls from doctors who were astonished. They'd never seen anything like that. But we were constantly underestimating how well people can heal because we just assume chronicity. Like, oh, if it's damaged, it never gets better. And, and people don't realize yet, at least universally, that the chronicity is being caused by that continued injury of their lifestyle and their diet and their malnourishment. You know, so so it's it's really it's a lot of hope. It's really incredible to see really that even the stuff that we right now are facing, it doesn't have to be this bad, but it's, it's also really, um, it's showing people how well are you taking care of yourself? How healthy are you? Because if you can't get this virus and recover, you're not as healthy as you thought you were. So, you know, a lot of people are really try finding out now how healthy they truly are. And it really does come down to the diet. I'm really interested to geek out a little bit with you about the biochemical kind of like interactions between the food that we eat and our immune system. When we eat all these, you know, green smoothies and cruciferous vegetables and tomatoes and carrots and all these beautiful colors, what is actually going on in the blood with our white blood cells and stuff? Why is it that these 
this type of food, why is it that it why is why is it that it affects the immune system in such a positive way? What what is it about vegetables that is so magical? You know, when a species eats the diet it was meant to eat, its health is optimal, right? Uh, we see this in in animals people like to have in their homes, right? That when you feed a cat. Uh, cat food that has rice and corn and all this stuff in it, the cats get fat and get diabetes, right? You see all these fat cats walking around because people are buying food that looks like what they would want to eat, but it's not the natural diet for their cat, right? That when, but when a species eats what it's supposed to eat, their health is right. Uh, and so we are biologically herbivores. And when we eat things that grow from the planet, our health is better. So, you know, naturally we are not carnivores. And I mean, it really is that this is the right diet. And and there's, you can look up all the reasons why I'm sure you guys have put it in, in your news many times, looking at our digestive tract, looking at our teeth, looking at our lack of claws, looking at our eyes, all the kind of stuff, right? So in order for cells to function properly, they need certain nutrients, right? So if you think about building a piece of Ikea furniture, right? You need to have all the, the little wooden plugs they have. You need to have the special screws. You need the Allen wrench. Without the Allen wrench, you got nothing, right? So, so our cells are very much like that. They're very simple and they need certain things to function properly. Vitamins, minerals, um, antioxidants. Uh, whenever people hear those words, they're usually thinking of a bottle with pills in it, but actually where you want to get those from is food. The number one most common thing that people are deficient in is minerals. Well, where do minerals come from? They come from the soil. And what's in contact with the soil where we would get the highest level of minerals would be vegetables, right? Uh, most people are fruit deficient too, but when, when you do eat fruit, fruit comes from the top of the tree. There's some vitamins in it, very little minerals. And plus some people will take vitamins, but minerals were very deficient. Start looking at minerals. Well, where do you get minerals? Vegetables. Who has the highest dose? If we're deficient, we don't want a, a little bit of minerals. We want a high dose of minerals. And so we started looking at what vegetables have the highest dose of nutrition and cruciferous vegetables. I mean, nobody beats them. You know, nobody wants to eat them, but nobody beats them in terms of dosage. You know, kale, broccoli, cauliflower, and especially when people eat them in their raw form, it was fixing these deficiencies really quickly. So even though his friend was making supplements, we decided, you know, it made more sense to eat the food. So vegetables, super, super important. And when we do something we call hypernourishing. So hypernourishing is the protocol we develop. So it's a specific protocol designed to uh, create this intentional overdose in the nutrients people are missing so that they can repair their body in record time. And then the other thing that's really important, um, that what's really important that wasn't brought up much before we entered the scene was the omega-3 fatty acids piece. And I think it's because you know, the early folks who were looking at, you know, plant-based medicine and disease, they were doing this kind of all or nothing approach where you're either eating a Western fat filled diet, meat, dairy, or let's try plants and no fat. And what they found is plants and no fat way better than, you know, the Western diet, but they never really looked in the middle ground. What about testing different kinds of fats. There are plant-based fats. There's different kinds of plant fats. What do they do in the body? So what, looking at metabolism, my husband got really, really interested in that. And so we found that when you look at the immune system, the immune system is actually built off of components of our diet. So while our body can make certain things like cholesterol, we, we can make that, that's fine. But omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, which are the precursors of our immune cells, those must be consumed. Now, we don't have a problem with omega-6 fatty acids. Omega-6 fatty acids create the inflammatory immune system. The inflammatory immune system is very important. That is the immune system that responds to the virus. The inflammatory immune system is uh, involved if you injure yourself. I'm clumsy. I'm constantly banging into stuff, right? So if you bang your knee and your knee swells up, inflammatory immune system is coming in to bring in the cells you need to repair the damage, right? But we also have an omega-3 fatty acid-based anti-inflammatory immune system that's supposed to bring us back to baseline, back to normal. Now these should have a balance to them. And what they've seen looking at research, and you know, we don't know for sure, but when they looked at healthy populations in the world that didn't tend to have inflammatory illnesses, they found that they had somewhere between a one-to-one -to, -one to a nine-to-one ratio of six to three. When they did that same study, and this was, I remember reading the study when I was a resident, so it's a minute ago, okay? Uh, when, they, <laughs> when they looked at Americans at the time, the average ratio of six to three was 40 to one. 
But when people have decided out of curiosity to test it, I have seen anywhere from 40 to one to 200 to one, six to three. So their body makes inflammation like gangbusters all day long, inflammation, no problem, no ability to remove inflammation. So again, when we're looking at hypernourishment, we are trying to rapidly fix this imbalance. So we say, first of all, stop getting inflamed. You know, so omega-6 fatty acids, you find that in meat and dairy the most, like the, the highest concentration of these fatty acids come from animal products. It's also in a lower concentration in things like nuts and seeds. Actually, it's at the right level in nuts and seeds, somewhere around a nine to one, six to one ratio in most nuts and seeds. <clears throat> so if the only source of those fatty acids came from us finding, you know, a walnut tree, we would be fine. But people are eating such high amounts from these other sources, also oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, all the oils people use for cooking, really. So people are flooded with that and you can see it in the blood. And then omega-3 fatty acids, well, Naturally, if you were just eating something like walnuts, again, you would have the right balance. You get in some three, some six. Also, walnut or omega threes are also in things like kale, small amounts. So again, if we didn't have these processed foods, if we didn't have animal products, we wouldn't have to focus on ingesting high doses of omega three. We're trying to fix a chronic problem. So what I do is I have people eat high doses of things that are very rich in omega three. So flax seeds, chia seeds, or cold pressed flax or chia seed oil works very well because they are mostly omega-3. And so if you're doing that and you're avoiding anything that's a high omega-6 source, you can start fixing that ratio. And what I see is very quickly, often within the first week or so, visibly inflammation comes down. You know, my rapid recovery programs where I'm watching people every day, often they still feel sick systemically when they're finishing the first week, but for some reason their wedding ring fits again that hasn't been able to fit for three years because the inflammation is coming down quickly. So we are doing something that, you know, I'm not telling people to do that forever, right? But for this period of time, when you're trying to change the course of your disease, when you're trying to stop the momentum of getting sick and instead slow it down, stop it and reverse it, we really do need that hyper nourishment approach to say, let's fill this all in. You need tons of vitamins and minerals. We need to get those omega threes up. And then the other ingredient that's missing for most people is their water intake. So water is involved in all the different chemical reactions that go on in our body. It's extremely important. And most folks barely drink it. I mean, I'll, I'll say myself, Oh, we are so dehydrated. And you know, the, the, num the two most common things people buy medicines for are caused by dehydration, headaches and constipation. If you're dehydrated, you probably have those two things, right? Or one of the two. So, you know, water is an essential component. When, when I changed my diet, I was drinking coffee and Diet Coke because I was a, a, an intern. Like if it had caffeine, I'd drink it, but why water, right? And overnight I switched to a gallon of water a day. I said, okay, let me try what Thomas is saying. Let me do this. And it makes an enormous difference. And water's involved in all these chemical reactions. So if you are uh, sick or if you're overweight, trying to lose weight and you're exercising, but it won't come off, uh, good chance you're dehydrated. And if you added the water, suddenly those reactions would take place and the fat would come off and the illness would go away. So water is extremely important as well. And again, we're getting people to higher levels. I tell people, you know, a good place to start would be like, if you, you know, 96 to 128 ounces, depending on your weight, right? If you're only hundred pounds, hundred ounces, and, and you're going to have to convert that to kilograms. I'm not going to do it. The, could it be said though, that then that these are the necessary building blocks for, um, you know, a good quality of life with regards to our cells. And if you get it right, and you, as you say, hypernourish your body on a regular basis and try to avoid as much as you can, the inflammatory foods, your body's gonna operate in peak performance, that's it. But moving on to my next question, which is kind of connected to that. Dr. Dean Orner said that we could save 80% of our healthcare costs if we switch to a whole food plant-based diet. What do you think about this? It's absolutely the case that if we change to plant-based eating, most of the issues people have would go away. I mean, the most common reason people die right now in the U.S. is heart attacks, and that is caused by diet. And yes, there are some things that are purely genetic, but those are very rare and minute. I mean, even when you look at, for example, type 2 diabetes, highly genetic. If you have one parent with type 2 diabetes, it's very likely that you will have the gene for type 2 diabetes. But if you are a vegan marathon runner, you're not going to get type 2 diabetes. It's just, you just, you will not. You have to turn on that gene expression. I had lupus at 16, but I didn't have it before 16. Something turned the gene on, right? So we have this set of genes, but it's kind of like when you're playing a card game, if you're playing poker or something, you don't have to keep those cards that you were dealt with, right? We do have a choice of how to play that hand. 
And that's where the power is, is how do you want to play this? So rather than writing it off that this is the genetic pattern of my family, say, okay, I've inherited the genetics of my family. I've also inherited the habits of my family. I can change the habits. We have power over that. And that will dramatically change the health and the happiness of people all around the world if they do that. But you're also very active as well, aren't you? I get that, you know, your husband's very active and, you know, fitness and exercise is good. But we'll, we'll, we'll pause that for a sec because I really want to ask you, we're running a little low on time, but I want to talk now and, and move on towards medicine and vaccines. Now, very short and simple question. Um, in your opinion as a doctor and, and a sort of a, an expert in, in the immune system, what is more important, a healthy lifestyle and a whole food plant-based diet or should we be leaning more on things like medicine, to especially vaccines? So, so the answer is that all of it's important. You know, in terms of how our bodies are going to respond to any kind of infection or illness, the way we treat our body is going to be the most important thing, right? So people who already are obese, have chronic illness, their immune systems are already not functioning very well. And then you add something like a really aggressive virus, uh, the body is, is, there's a good chance they're not going to survive, right? Or if they do survive, they're going to be extremely sick or even chronically ill from it afterwards. So the health of our body is very important. And I think the pandemic has brought that out a lot. There's also medicines that can be life-saving as well. Uh, I'm still a medical doctor. I still got the coat. I still work with people, uh, even in terms of medications, but I use them in a very different way. I use medications as a way to treat symptoms and save lives while also working on getting the person healthy enough that they hopefully won't ever need those again, right? Some people will need them. If they come to me after 30 years of thyroid disease, even when we get rid of the disease and the antibodies are gone, you know, some of that thyroid's already destroyed. It's never going to be 100%. Good thing we have a medicine you can take that can replace some of the hormone, right? That, that we have to deal with whatever the assaults have been on the body that maybe they can't recover from. Or... Right now, you might need medicines to keep you alive while we then work on how we're going to undo it through nutrition. So medicine is important. And and I was just talking to someone yesterday about this, that, you know, if you get sick with COVID and you can't breathe, go to the hospital, let them help you, let the doctors help you. So uh, I, I don't believe in this all or nothing approach to anything in life, really. All or nothing is really a tough way to go. You know, we don't want to throw away all the amazing technology and breakthroughs we've had in Western medicine and other types of medicine as well. Uh, we want to incorporate everything we know. Humans are amazing. We've come up with so much information about nutrition, about medicine, about all these things that can extend, extend and improve our quality of life. The problems come when we rely too much on one thing or the other right? That if you rely solely on medicine, it doesn't work out. And that's what's happened to our world right now, right? Is people are sicker than ever. They're on more medicines than ever. Nobody's getting better, right? I mean, when I got lupus uh, at 16, we didn't have a lot of medicines to treat it. We didn't have Plaquenil yet, right? I was on high doses of steroids, chemotherapy. I was taking seven different pills a day, but it's different than what they use now. There's now been millions and millions of dollars pumped into that industry. There's many, many fancy medicines and people are still dying from lupus. It's not changing. Right. So when we rely only on medicines, we have a problem. But um, I I think we do need to diversify that a bit. So things like vaccines. All right. I'm going to put it out there. Right. Vaccines are something that I studied intensively, especially when I realized I could have children. Right. So before uh, I healed from lupus, I trusted everything that I learned in my medical education. Um, So at first, I never questioned any of it. But when I was able to have my first son, which was supposed to be medically impossible, and I still didn't have any lupus, and the only thing I ever did was change my diet, I started to question and ponder if everything I learned was correct. (laughs) If lupus was not incurable, and my cholesterol was not high because of genetics, but rather my addiction to, to eggs and cheese, then maybe some of the other things I learned were also incorrect. And now that I had a child coming, I didn't want to do anything that could potentially harm him or not be the right thing to do based on what I learned. So I really did take time to learn and understand vaccines because, you know, once you have a baby, it's like, all right, come in, there's 10 today and 10 tomorrow and, you know, and it felt very jarring and scary to do that. Um, I will say that my children are 100 percent vaccinated um, because what I learned is that vaccines actually are something that helped people, that what they do is that they prime our immune system to create antibodies in advance, just in case you get exposed to something, which helps us. So definitely the people who need it the most are the people who are sick and vulnerable. 
because their immune systems don't work properly to begin with. So if they can get a head start on making some antibodies before they meet the virus, that's going to only benefit them, right? Um, but it, you just, you want to be careful, I think, to, at least to me, I want to use everything we have at our, at, available to us. So, you know, the, the COVID vaccines, I think, have been an important breakthrough. And I got mine. Uh, I'm not going to hedge any bets, right? I am extremely healthy. My blood tests could be in frames, all right? But, but I, I also want to do everything I can. And the way these vaccines work is that, you know, they come in, your body sees it, it makes an antibody, and then they disappear again. They don't alter your genetic code. They don't damage your cells. They just give your immune system a heads up. Hey, there's this thing. It kind of looks like this. If you see him, be ready, right? You know, like in those movies, they walk in, have you seen this guy? If you see this guy, call the police, right? That it primes the immune system and gets it ready. So I really believe that that's the best thing we can do is embrace that and get yourself as healthy as possible with your nourishment so you're ready to go. Right. The, the woman that I told you about that I saw yesterday that got COVID at the wedding, you know, she's been hyper nourishing for a year. She she eliminated lupus doing that. She got her vaccines also and got COVID at the wedding. And all she has a little bit of a sore throat. She feels fine. Is it because of hyper nourishment alone? Is it the combination of the vaccine and the hyper nourishment? Uh, I think it's probably all of the above. Her boyfriend also got vaccinated, but he has autoimmune disease, cancer, and he can't get out of bed. Right. So how well it works will also be uh, something that's related to your um, to your health level. But it's, it's unfortunate to me that this has been controversial. I have had people whenever I've talked about it, I get I get people who are like, I can't believe you would say that. We thought you were about natural healing unfollow. And they always have to make a dramatic statement before they unfollow, you know, uh, and then there's folks who are like, thank God you're speaking reason. It makes me want to follow you more. Um, you know, everyone's going to have to decide how they go here. But when you look at the science and the results, that's, that's what I believe is the best thing is we need to use Western medicine, but not rely on it solely. We need to also do everything it takes to make our body healthy so that it can fight, survive and thrive. Absolutely. Some fantastic uh, feedback there. I think from my perspective, as someone who's very, you know, embedded in the vegan community, uh, you know, a community which is often was seen as a very fringe movement, people who are attuned to not following the status quo, who have realized that actually this narrative that we need to eat milk, meat, milk and eggs to be healthy and fit is not is just completely untrue. And so it can, when you adopt the lifestyle, start to make you question everything around you. And you start to really, really wonder whether you can actually trust anyone at all when it comes to what we eat and what we put in our bodies, including medicine. Um, vaccines, in my personal yeah, and vaccines, in my personal opinion, the reason there's so much hesitancy is because people do not understand how they work, and people fear things that they do not understand. I spend a lot of time reading as much as I can about how vaccines work. The you know the function you said I love the the the, the metaphor you used there. The vaccine goes in, it alerts the immune system. The immune system goes, hey, you know, I recognize you. Goodbye, you're dead. You know, get rid of you, get rid of you. And that is the way the immune system functions. But it works in collaboration with a vaccine. But the vaccine goes in, and then it's done. The body does the work, not the vaccine. I think people have this vision that vaccines go into your blood and the vaccine hangs out in your blood and the vaccine magically kills any COVID virus. And it also might damage your body and give you various other illnesses. But it's your body that does the work. And I just want to turn a little on to vaccine efficacy. Um, Dr. Josh Cullimore is a friend of mine. He's over in the US now. He wrote a great uh, paper, uh, not paper, article on vaccine efficacy in collaborate in conjunction with a healthy plant-based diet that people who are healthy physically are more likely to have a more successful vaccine e efficacy within their bodies and that if you're unhealthy and you're drinking and smoking and you're obese and you live a terrible lifestyle that the vaccine is unlikely to be as effective as it could be if you lived if you lived healthily and had a healthy body and diet what could be said about this and how the two work together I agree with that. And and the other thing that I think is most important, at least the way I do my practice, is it's always results-based. I, I think that once we get into the theoretical realm, people can argue. But when you get into results, there's nothing to argue. This is what happens, right? So, uh, you know, I have been working the entire time through the pandemic, and I have seen a lot of people with COVID, um, post or long haul COVID, and people who have lost family members. I know people personally who have lost family members. I have, we know people we've lost. So I have seen what the virus has done to people's lives. Out of all of this time, 
I have seen two people who had side effects from a vaccine and both of them were able to recover and it wasn't something that was life threatening in any way. You know, one was a, she had some, some neurological stuff going on in, in her feet. She was able to recover. Um, and the most common one is like um, ringing in the ears. People who already have ringing in their ears. It can make it louder, right? Which is annoying, but not life threatening, right? So that's it. But two people, and, and I'm working all day, every day through the whole time, two people, whereas all day, every day, COVID, 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 COVID. So when you're looking at results, the people who are getting the virus and who are unprotected are, are having a horrible experience, life-threatening experience, and possibly dying. And for the most part, the people who are vaccinated, they have a rough day. I'll say, I got my vaccine. I didn't feel great the next day. I was like, oh, it's working. I have a fever. <laughs> so obviously it's working, which it, it, that actually means that it's working. Your immune system is responding, but that's it. And then you're back to normal and you feel good. So when you're looking at what's happening with real people, as much as people are afraid, you know, I actually was, was meeting with someone. She was equally afraid of COVID and the vaccine. And I said, that's not actually correct to be equally afraid of those two things. One is life-threatening and one isn't. Right. But even with the mRNA one, a lot of the people are messaging about that. They're saying it changes your DNA because they hear RNA and then they go, oh, that's that's part of uh, that's interacting with DNA. It's going to change your genetics. But that's not how it works. mRNA comes in and tells your body to make a protein. And the protein is the spike protein that the virus has. And so it makes the protein and your antibody and your immune system goes, hey, that doesn't belong here. And it makes an antibody to it. And then the protein dissolves, the mRNA dissolves and it's gone. But now your immune system knows how to make antibodies to a spike protein, which is actually really cool because it used to be with vaccines, we had to give people the virus to get their body to make it either low doses of the virus or a, a, a broken version of the virus that's weaker or a dead virus, right? Now we can trick it. We don't even need to give you any virus at all. We can just give you one protein that's not going to affect your body at all. And, and that will help you make uh, immune cells. So it's actually really exciting that we've gotten to the point where there's not that risk that there used to be of giving someone like a weakened virus that some people with poor immune systems might react to. We're not even giving them virus at all. And like you said, the ingredients go away. Um, so, but your ability to, pr to make antibodies, that is going to be really dependent on the health of your immune cells. Like I was saying before, you know, we literally create our immune system out of our diet. So if you have a sluggish, sick immune system, even with a vaccine, you're not going to be as protected as someone who has a really optimal, healthy immune system because you're eating a healthy diet, and then that vaccine comes in and goes, yep, yeah, okay, I'm ready, and they may not even notice if they get the virus. It's incredible. With all this that we know, though, every time we turn on the TV, we hear the media talking about COVID, of course, and vaccines for our, you know, to save us, but very little about nutrition. You know, does that frustrate you that the mainstream media doesn't talk more about how nutrition in collaboration or in conjunction with vaccines can um, break the connection between hospitalization and death? Uh, I don't get frustrated anymore because it's a status quo and I don't want to waste emotion on things. I really don't waste emotion. I just try to be part of the solution. So, I mean, I've been on the news uh, throughout the pandemic all around the country. Um, and even last week, I was on the news twice talking about the autoimmune diseases and nutrition. So I'm always, and they, they know me, the different stations now, they know me and they like to have me on. So, you know, it, it's, I'm doing my part to try to improve the dialogue. It was funny though, the last time I, I was on, I was talking about how important nutrition is for the immune system. And I was talking about vitamins and minerals and omega-3s. And on the B-roll, they were showing pictures of people stir frying chicken. And I'm like, who's doing the B-roll? <laughs> what is happening? So I didn't even post that clip into my social media. I went, oh my God, they're, the B-roll. They're like, show B-roll of food. Okay. And it's just someone like making chicken. I went, oh my goodness. So if someone's, you know, just seeing the banner and the, and the picture and they don't hear me talking, they got the wrong information. But um, I try not to get down about the negative stuff out there. I mean, even some, you know, having been someone who's vegetarian, vegan for so much of my life, and I care deeply about people and animals and the planet and all these things, I care so much that if I constantly focused on what was wrong, I'd be in a state of depression. And I think it's something that that's high risk for people who care a lot, right? People who don't care or don't pay attention, they can just, you know, play golf and not think about it. Uh, but when you do care deeply, it can build on you. So I try not to focus on 
what's wrong emotionally. I just focus on how can I be a part of the solution? How can I make this better? So yes, anytime I get a call about, hey, do you want to comment on this illness? Do you want to comment on COVID on the news? Yes, I would absolutely. And I always bring nutrition to it every single time. Um, I will do every interview people ask me to do. I'm constantly putting stuff out there for free. So I think all of us need to come together to just keep raising the message louder because listen, I've seen it change so much, even over the past decade. I mean, when I first started talking about my own journey with lupus, I had so many people who would comment, that's not true. You can't get better from lupus. Da, 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 da. And now it's very rare. If one person says you're full of it, 20 people say, nope, I've read her book and my lupus is gone. This is gone. This is gone. Like I don't have to even, I don't even have to respond because it is just so much more widely accepted than ever before, thanks to the internet, thanks to social media. So I, I think that the truth always comes out. You know, if you continuously speak the truth, there's nothing anyone can do to, to argue with it. It's the truth, right? And so we continue to speak the truth and it's getting louder and louder. Now we've got researchers like your friend who are confirming it, who are bringing it to that to the mainstream more and more. And eventually, it's going to be accepted, you know, just like with cigarettes, you know, both my parents were smokers in the eighties and in the seventies, in the sixties, in the fifties, they already had research out showing that, Hey, it might cause emphysema and cancer, but everyone ignored it. Finally in the eighties, the FDA said, by the way, cigarettes do cause cancer. Oh crap. <laughs> but the data was there, but the doctors were smoking and they were addicted. Right. And there was industry. Oh my God. I mean, the cigarette lobbyists, right. There was so much pushing against it, but eventually the truth just had to come out and then it changed things. And I think we're heading there now with meat, dairy, you know, dairy sales are down, right? People are eating more and more plant-based options for food. I mean, McDonald's, Burger King have plant-based options, Kentucky fried chicken. When I was a kid, there was someone who told me that would never happen, right? And here we are, 2022, and there's plant-based options. They, they're unhealthy, <laughs> but they're having vegan options. You know, uh, some people will argue, yes, they're cooked in the same grease, whatever. For someone who's not vegan, that's as vegan as they've ever been in their life, right? That, that these are even showing up as options. Things are changing, and the truth is becoming more widely accepted. And, and I think it will continue to change. So, no, I'm not frustrated. I'm actually really heartened and excited about how, how much this is progressing and how many more lives we're saving now than ever before. Amazing. Uh, before we come to the end now, I've got one uh, final question to you and we could ask a few more there. But it's the um, irony of this whole situation is that three out of four infectious diseases come from animals. We're in a pandemic, quite likely because of the way we treat and farm and grow animals. How much does this motivate you to continue to talk about this? Because obviously cutting out animals from our diets, it could prevent future pandemics, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, when I was in medical school, they were already predicting the pandemic was going to happen. Um, that, you know, we have these epidemics, which are spreading of a disease, but then it, it, it ends before it spreads to the rest of the world. Right. And then the pandemic will be the one where nothing can stop it and it's going to cover the globe. And so they were preparing us then. It's going to happen. And over the course of my career, I saw it starting. There was threats of it where they thought it was going to happen, but then it didn't with things like swine flu, bird flu. Right. All of these came from factory farms. All of these came from from animal husbandry. All of that's where it came from. And then people got sick and it started to spread. And went, Maybe this is a pandemic. Oh, no. OK, we're OK. Right. And then finally it happened. And yes, it's very likely that it was because of the meat market. Um, so this is something that's, that needs to be an ongoing conversation. Unfortunately, it just becomes um, more about people having their conspiracy theories that, you know, maybe it was on purpose or this or that, or that, but really we need to get down to what is it really coming from? And again, how are we creating disease in ourselves? And one of the reasons we're creating disease in ourselves is one, because we shouldn't be eating animals to begin with, but two, because the fact of keeping them all together in the way that we do is making them sick and share disease. And then that's making people sick as well, right? So it's an important part of the conversation. And, and I haven't seen that be the conversation on the news much. I mean, I try not to watch too much news because I protect my emotional health, um, but I don't really see them talking about like, why would it be 
that a, the coronavirus could come from a meat market. And what has that ever happened before? And let's do a deeper dive. Like that'd be great to see, but I, I have not seen that yet. That's so fascinating. Dr. Brooke Goldner, thank you so much for joining us again on the PBN podcast for a second episode. What a pleasure. I feel like every time I talk to you, my brain is just bursting with all this information. I absolutely love it. And I cannot wait to share it with people who need it because I know that there are a lot of people out there who are not hypernourishing, who are deeply ill and sick and struggling. Uh, and your information and your passion and your wisdom is uh, inspiring and life changing as always. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I love getting to hang out with you. And I really appreciate everything that you do every day. I constantly follow your social media and I'm always looking at what you're doing and you're always spreading so much positivity and empowerment for people. So it's really great to get to hang out with you. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I've been your host, Robbie Lockie, and this is the PBN Podcast. We'll be back next week with more food, fashion, nutrition, animals, and everything in between.